Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, David. I'm very excited Hello. to have this 45 minutes talking to you. I have around 40 questions. Let's see how much we can do within this time block. How are you doing? I'm doing well. It's great to be here. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, so when I was preparing for, for the fireside talk, um, and I looked for an article in Wikipedia about you. I found an article about David Schwartz uh, that was a, an author of a self-help book that is called The Magic of Thinking Deep. I think <laughs> that is actually a perfect coincidence. Um, so uh, in the book, uh, he described the three failure diseases in achieving success. First is exercitis, delightus, and procrastination. So my question to you is, what is your way of making better decisions and of thinking big? And what are the, the small things that maybe uh, create challenges uh, in achieving this? Well, I will say I am not the David Schwartz that wrote that book. I'm not <laughs> a book writer, but I, that certainly re those ideas certainly uh, resonate with me. Um, part of it, I think, is just reevaluating your strategy, just being flexible. Um, you, the, one of the things that that I hear a lot is that, like, to be a person who's leading a big idea, you have to sort of be unreasonably committed to the truth of that big idea. And while that might be true, because you can't achieve a result if you don't believe it's possible, you do have to be rational about the strategy and the tactics from time to time. And one of the things that we, we do at Ripple that I think is extremely important is we look at the world to say, are the things we're trying to do still possible in the world? Like big things happen. COVID-19 is a good example. Regulatory changes, elections, uh, wars even, or, or like, you know, there was an issues between China and the United States, a friction after a long-term friendship that may change your ability to do things. And so uh, remember the reason that you picked a particular strategy and look at what What's happening in the world and with and with your own infrastructure to say am i am i still on the right path and be be willing to say okay i need to you know make a slight adjustment make a slight change i think one of the big obstacles that gets to your that gets to people is they get too in love with the strategy rather than the goal so if your goal is to bank the unbanked or your goal is to make payments as simple as email. Just keep keep your eye on that and don't get too in love with the particular like microscopic tactics that you've made towards that approach because you can sort of you can sort of get in this um, I kind of call it cruise control where it's like oh we have this goal that's seven months away so there's nothing urgent right now it's I guess it is a version of procrastination we just kind of let yourself coast because you know you're still going in the right direction but. Uh, you know, there are competitors out there, there are, there are changes in the world that might result in change in strategy. So I would say that uh, the thing to avoid is that sense of putting yourself on cruise control. Great answer, thank you so much. Uh, recently you posted a survey on your Twitter. What is your position at Triple? I personally have voted for uh, chief choreographer. Uh, so my question to you would be, what is the dance that you are choreographing? at the moment, at people. You know, we have a lot of uh, moving parts and a lot of things going on. I, I, I explain it this way. Imagine if you came up with the idea for Twitter or the idea for YouTube 10 years earlier than those businesses or the idea for Uber. Imagine if you came up with the idea for Uber in the year, you know, 1996. Uh, you could not execute that idea directly because your target market doesn't exist. So imagine that you're a marketer at Twitter and I say to you, Christina, how are we going to get more people to have home internet access? How are we going to get more people to have to have phones so that they can tweet? You would say to me, that's not our problem. Like our, our target market are people who can use Twitter. We're Twitter. Our target market is people who can use Twitter. We're trying to build payment networks for a target market of people who are connected to these blockchain systems and these new payment systems. And that target market doesn't exist. So we have sort of a lot of different balls in the air and a lot of, I, I, I like the word dance. It is like a dance of trying to not just build the products and services that we want, but also the target market that we want them to 
to, uh, that we want to sell those products and services too. And the interesting thing is, this is this is paradoxical. We need our competitors to succeed. If you think about Twitter and your phone, like you probably 90% of the people I'm talking to right now could send a tweet right this second about what I'm talking about if they wanted to. Twitter did not put that capability in their pockets, right? It's um, companies like Samsung and Google building Android and Apple with the iPhone and the whole growth of the internet. But even earlier companies like GeoCities, let's say, that like made people want internet access or the early days of the internet. Those are competitors to Twitter, but they built Twitter's target market. So the dance that we're in is trying to grow an industry so that there is a group of people who can use the products and services we're building so that we don't just, we don't just have to build the products and services, we actually have to build the market for them. Great ideas, thank you so much. Uh, you've been in the space for over 10 years, right? Um, yeah. I would like to ask you what actually surprises you the most in the space now? What is that something that maybe you couldn't have imagined when you were studying? Something that you wouldn't expect to come? You know, there were there are a lot of surprises. This is I could probably do a you know give like my ten top most surprising things. I think the one thing that is kind of surprising to me is the sort of hostility to innovation in a lot of the space. And a lot of that comes from people who have invested heavily in a project. So I, 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 we can't talk about the cryptocurrency space without facing the reality that people, if you think Bitcoin is gonna take over the world, you probably own some Bitcoin. If you think Ethereum is gonna take over the world, you probably own some Ether. If you think the XRP ledger is the greatest thing in the world and everyone's gonna use it for everything, you probably hold some XRP. And what that means is that if someone tells you, hey, Bitcoin has this problem or Ethereum has this problem or the XRP ledger has this weakness, if they're right, then you will sort of lose, you will perceive yourself as losing money. And so what happens is people dig in very, very deeply and nobody is invested in the project that doesn't exist yet. And so there's this sort of uh, hostility and innovation, this idea that, oh, if you want to build, um, if you want to, like, I'll, I'll pick on Bitcoin, I shouldn't, but I will, but just understand that this is not a specific criticism of Bitcoin. It's a sort of a, just, it's an easy to understand example. The Lightning Network doesn't threaten Bitcoin in any way. The Lightning Network is something that enhances Bitcoin's usability. And so if you're a Bitcoin maximalist, you like the Lightning Network. It's, it's sort of good innovation. Whereas if Ethereum is improving its scalability, and you could perceive that as a threat to Bitcoin, so you would sort of perceive that as bad innovation. And what's happened is the same thing I joined the cryptocurrency industry to get away from. So one of the things that frustrated me about the movement of money is everybody is like, don't innovate at the lowest layers, build on top of the existing systems. And of course, all of the existing banks and financial institutions want you to build on top of their existing technology because that's what enriches them. And what's happened is the same thing has happened in the cryptocurrency community. People are now saying, no, build on top of Bitcoin because I'm invested in it. Build on top of Ethereum because I'm invested in it. Don't build the new technologies that are better or that threaten the incumbents. They're incumbents. Can you believe it? Like Bitcoin was like a radical movement that was crazy. And now it's like the big, in it's, it's the it's the institution that people don't want you to threaten now. It, it's it's certainly a perverse and unexpected. Uh, although in retrospect, I guess everything should have been expected. Yeah, that's a very good observation. Uh, do you think that this clean sheet approach uh, even decreased with the cri with the crisis that we um, that we all had this spring? I mean, I personally see that people became more conservative in terms of uh, approach to politics, to healthcare, to their own communicative uh, tools, et cetera, et cetera. Do you think that also this approach to doing business and approach to uh, update technology uh, instead of uh, create something from the scratch um, suffers from, from the crisis as, as we had this spring? I do think so. I think that a lot of big projects just kind of put the brakes on and they took a little bit of time to say, you know, whoa, what's what's going on here? I think there became a period of sort of introspection. At first, um, no one's going to start like when when when, you know, uh, particularly when you just had the announcement of a pandemic and you just saw like the numbers starting to go up and there was a concern about whether, you know, hospitals might be overwhelmed. No one's going to launch a big new project in circumstances like that. Like that would just be reckless. And it took people uh, a little bit of time just to say, okay, um, 
we can still do things, but we also have these new considerations. And it took it took companies various amounts of time, in some cases, you know, months, and some companies are still in that process of deciding, like, can are our plans still realistic? Are we going to return to, I mean, are we going to have a vaccine in four months and then we're going to be normal again in six months? Or, or is this going to be, or is this going to be this weird situation for years and years and years? And we have to rethink everything that we're doing. And I think a lot of companies had to choose. This was, this was a kind of painful choice for a lot of companies between you using money to help people and contributing to emergency relief funds and conserving cash because they didn't know when their businesses would be able to return to normal. I think a lot of companies had to shed employees and um, it definitely just shook up, I mean, literally every every industry. And now, um, now, obviously, you've got protests going on and you've got the defund the police movement, which is creating a little bit you know, more uncertainty. And then again, and then you have that same thing, because like part of you is like we want to do something about to to help in a, in, a, in, a, in a crisis situation. But also you have to think realistically about long term, like you want your business to be able to keep its employees, even if there's a reduction in your ability to sell products or your ra- ability to raise revenue. Um, so it, it's, it's been an, it's been an, it's been an interesting time. I, I, anyone who, who got into that problem of being on cruise control was shaken out of it. I'm sure by a situation where you just literally can't continue on the path that you, you just, it just wasn't possible. Yeah. We've all been out of our comfort zone, uh, for sure. Um, I've actually checked your blog, uh, and I've seen that you haven't posted anything during, um, during the lockdown. But I see that you build up a home studio. So mm-hmm. how did the lockdown impact your life and what new projects did it bring to, to your everyday uh, life? Well, I do want to say that I was planning on launching a podcast before the coronavirus. Uh, we even had studio time booked. And so the home studio thing came from, uh, you know, the necessity to do it at home, which is a little interesting. You get dogs barking and sometimes get a child to wander in, you know, which is it. it, it it's great. But I do have a podcast, Block Stars, where I talk to people in the industry. Um, and it's it's a real um, down to basics. It's not really aimed at like detailed technical things. It's more at helping people understand what's going on in the industry. Um, as for how the lockdown has changed like my life and the way I do things, it didn't change things for me personally from a work standpoint all that much. I think the big, because I can work from, you know, the work that I do, I can do from home. But the thing that I miss the most is like, I would eat my lunch in one of three, Ripple has three cafeterias at their main office and I would eat at a different one so that I would meet different people. And I would sometimes just walk around one of the floors that we have there so I could, you know, run into different people, the kind of five minute meeting where someone would say, hey, David, hey, can I talk to you about, or some people would be having a conversation conversation. They would just call me in because I was like right across the hall. It's harder to do that when people are spread around the world. And so finding those ways, uh, new employees are like, we're we're still hiring, by the way, I I should, I should shout that out that if you're looking for a a role, particularly in engineering and technical roles, we're still hiring. But that means we have to figure out how to onboard employees without being able to like talk to them person to person. And that's a little bit unusual. Like we used to do this thing where new employees would go around the office with like a cart full of like premium snacks, like really good snacks. And of course all the other employees would want, and like to get the snack, you have to talk to the new employee. And uh, that was a lot of fun. And uh, you can't bring around premium snacks on Zoom. So, you know, we have to, but it ha- it hasn't impacted our ability to do business as much as as you might think. It impacted our partners, like I was saying before, short term partners who people who we thought were like about to sign contracts would be like, wait a minute, we need we need some time to figure out what's going on. And our sales team was really impacted because they had to learn how to sell remotely. But the interesting thing is, is a lot of things that you think have to be done in person, like our sales team. If you had asked them before this, like, could you go all remote? They would have said, there's no way. Um, but they figured out how to do that. I guess it helps when the people you're selling to don't want you to come into their office either. You know, so it, it, it's, it's definitely, we're definitely living in interesting times, which I understand is a Yiddish curse. So. Did you spend much time coding this month? You know, I, I, I joke that there's two types of people in this world, engineers and managers. And what I mean by engineers is like people who feel like they're working when they're coding. And when they're in a meeting, they're like, oh man, I have to like, I have to stop work. I want to get this done. But after this meeting, I'll get back to work. And then there's managers who feel like they can't do any work unless they're in a meeting. 
I, at heart, am the engineer type. I really like to get my hands dirty and build things. And, I, you know, and since I took the CTO role, I haven't been coding as much. And I'll tell you a funny story. Just a couple of days ago, I had an idea for a way to improve something in the XRP Ledger software. And I'm like, oh, I'm just going to work on this. And I was starting to get my hands dirty again. And I got those like feelings of accomplishment again. And uh, my friend, Nick Bugalis, who heads the, uh, the XRP Ledger team, uh, asked me what I was, he just happened to be talking to me and I wanted to show him what I was doing because I was so excited about it. So I showed him what I was doing. He said, hey, that's a great idea. Let me assign that to someone. You shouldn't be wasting your time on that. I'm like, no, that isn't the reason I had this conversation with you. So I really miss coding. I, I do. I, I've i been so busy with other things. I also have a new grandchild. So that's kind of taken a lot of my non-work oh, time. Congratulations. Thank you. So I, I, I haven't really, I haven't been getting my hands dirty and I, and I do miss it. I really do. I'm sure you will find time when the right moment will come. Uh, let's get back to this podcast. So are you uh, building up the podcast as uh, David or as Joe? <laughs> I, I, I guess as David, that's, it's kind of funny that, you know, I picked that, I got that, that alias way back in high school. And uh, when I was using early bulletin board systems, which, um, Think of it as like the internet, but on clay tablets and, you know, stone and made out of stone kind of thing. And I didn't want to use my real name. And so I, I picked a friend of mine, picked that alias and it just kind of has, has followed me everywhere I've gone, despite the fact that obviously it's not a secret now that, you know, Joel Katz is, is me. But yeah, that was kind of, that idea came from some people at Ripple who thought that it would really be a good idea to to, to sort of explain to people just some of the very basics, so, so, it, some focus on things Ripple are doing, but mostly focus on challenges that the industry is facing, uh, like regulatory challenges and, and just um, the basics of the technology of just how does this thing work? What does it do? What's, what's special about it? And of course, it is to some extent like my unique point of view, which I hope, I hope brings something to the table. The name was inspired by uh, Stimson Cat, yeah, right? From the Ran and Stimpy show. Yeah. So my friend in in, in high school, he I, I hope he's listening. Uh, he he was a fan of Ren and Stimpy, which was a cartoon show back in the day. And so he Stimp Stimpy's full name is Stimson J Cat. So he made me Stimson J Cats, uh, which he thought sounded more human. Now here's, I guess this is probably the funniest part of the story. I was inspired by the story of 3M. So 3M was originally Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing, and they didn't like that name. And they thought 3M was like a sexier, more modern and cool hip sounding name. And um, it wasn't a radical change because they because like if they could say, hey, you know, Minnesota mining and manufacturing, there's three M's in there, so now we're three M. So when they wanted to pick a new name, they probably picked three M because it made the transition easier. So I did the same thing. I started thinking, what's a hipper, cooler name? Well, Joel Katz is pretty cool uh, that I could get to. And so I went from S Joel from like um Stimson J Katz to Stimson Joel Katz, because J has to stand for something, right? And then I went down to S Joel Katz. This took months because like if you have a first name that you don't really like, you might I'd abbreviate your first name and go by your middle name. Then I just dropped the S to become Joel Katz. So after about, you know, four to seven months, I had rebranded myself as Joel Katz, a more human sounding name, I guess. Wonderful. Why did you pick up Joel? What did, why did you interpret, it, interpret J as Joel? You know, I really don't remember. I think it was just a, 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 a good sounding name that just started with J, but I could have, I suppose I could have used Jeremy or Jeffrey or any, those don't sound as cool. Come on. Joel is clearly a better name. I guess, I, I guess that was the opportunity of me to name my first uh, sort of intellectual child, I guess. And uh, Joel was the name that I picked when I could have picked anything. So maybe that tells you something about me. Probably nice. not. And do you like cats? <laughs> kind of. My mother used to be almost part crazy cat lady. She would feed all the neighborhood cats and all the neighbors would get annoyed because all the cats would, would come by. And uh, um, I, I do like them. I mean, I like petting them, but I'm mostly a dog person. I, I like their independence. Um, the joke that I tell is that uh, when you have a dog, your dog thinks, wow, this person like takes care of all of my needs. They feed me. They must be the most important person in the world, the most important thing. When you have a cat, the cat thinks this person takes care of me. They feed me. They provide for my every need. I must be the most important thing in the world. <laughs> kind yeah. of the difference. Between Wonderful. The uh, you know, I actually, um, I found out today reading about uh, the, Re the Ren and Simpy show that there is an adult version of, of the cartoon. <laughs> Did you know about that? <laughs> 
I don't know whether I should or shouldn't. <laughs> well, I won't tell well, yeah, what uh, particularities does uh, Stimson J Cat uh, have there, <laughs> if you want after the after the show. <laughs> but um, speaking about differences between adults and um, well, junior content, uh, could you tell me? When do you think people need to be initiated to the blockchain technology? Now that we are building up the space, the environment, uh, we educate developers, managers, salespeople. When is the right moment to initiate these concepts of decentralization, blockchain, and crypto to children, in your opinion? You, you know, One of the things that I look to to sort of figure out how things might go, and I, and I think the parallels are much, much deeper than, than, than it might immediately appear, is the way the internet went from something that was used by military and used by universities and then like just technical nerds, people who just were really into the, 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 like the technological aspect of it and didn't mind that it was very uh, unfriendly. And then it gradually bled into popular culture. I remember the first time I heard a reference to Bitcoin on TV. And I also remember the first time that I heard references to the internet on TV. You know, I lived through that revolution. And I think there's big parallels there. And I think it's interesting that Ripple kind of Uh, picked the strategy, the internet parallel strategy very early, because in the early days of um, Bitcoin and the blockchain technologies, the early strategy was everybody used this for everything. Like everybody's Bitcoin strategy was everybody will use Bitcoin and then everything will just work, which is kind of like a religion that says we'd be a peaceful religion if everybody like had everybody believed in the same religion. Every religion's peaceful, right? If, any if we all use PayPal, then we could all pay each other really easily. The problem is we don't all want to use PayPal for good reasons. And um, it took us a while to realize that that sort of ground up, everybody used the new technology for everything strategy was not going to work at, at, at that early stage of the technology because the technologies were not mature enough. And so the strategy that we went after is very similar to what the internet did. We went after people who had very specific problems that the internet could solve, who wouldn't mind the fact that the sort of technical cost of admission was high at that time and that it, the technologies were sort of experimental. They didn't have a proven track record. There were regulatory issues. So we went after enterprise payments. And then what we've been doing, like I said before, is we're trying to build the infrastructure to create that sort of target market. And this is actually a perfect opportunity for me to bring up a technology that we just launched yesterday, along with a, a pretty large coalition of companies that represent uh, over 100 million users, which is PayID. And that's aimed at a very specific pain point in payments. So this is actually, it's actually kind of interesting because we had been working a lot from the sort of plumbing side of it. We basically we said, if everybody in the world is going to be able to pay everybody else, you need a lot of plumbing. You need like someone's going to pay in reals and someone's going to receive it in pesos. And so you need liquidity and you need, but there's another piece that you need too, which is you need the front end. You need the way for the user. When I want to email you, I just ask you your email address. Some magic, go, some complex technical magic goes on behind the scenes. Uh, but something we learned at Ripple was that um, like, it, uh, so like if you go back to like the enterprise payment world, when you make a payment, like you go to your bank and you make a payment, there's huge infrastructure that makes that payment work. There's JP Morgan Chase and Deutsche Bank and HSBC, and they have all this plumbing and they spend billions of dollars building it. But what's missing is the sort of payment setup. So your bank often can't even tell you what path the payment's going to take or what the fees are going to be, because the, the stupid, simple thing, when I send you an email, the first thing that happens is my computer talks, the computer from my email provider talks to the computer from your email provider, and they negotiate stuff. That early stage was missing from payments. And that was what Ripple built with RippleNet. And so PayID is that negotiation phase with the sort of human identifier for payments in the entire world. And um, it doesn't solve the problem of connecting all of the payment networks together, like in the plumbing, but, the, but you have a chicken and egg problem. Like if I built the plumbing, what would I do with it? If I created the bridge between two payment networks, how, how, how would I go get customers? Like it would be a nightmare. This connects all of that together. And, it, and at the same time, it provides regulatory compliance um, for cryptocurrency companies, and it enables interoperability between cryptocurrencies and fiat. So I think building from both sides is the way to get that sort of, you know, 
not not to insult grandmothers, but the joke I always say is like, so you, you're saying we say it's like, could your grandmother use it? Meaning someone who's not necessarily technically savvy, but someone who has has a you know has a phone knows how to use it, but doesn't want to doesn't want a twenty a, a you know forty minute lecture on how to make a payment. They just want to be able to make things work. So that big piece of the sort of messaging and the front end, the human readable identify. The great thing about email is I just ask you your email address. I don't have to care about any of the details, and it sort of just works. So um, we launched that coalition uh, literally just yesterday um, to build that sort of front end and messaging piece. Cool. So I imagine the communication uh, about this coalition with PayID uh, started long before uh, the lockdown and COVID crisis. But um, could you tell me, how do you think the lockdown in general has impacted the payments industry? and the approach, people's approach to payments? I don't think it's made that much of a difference. Um, I, our, customers are our customers are financial institutions and obviously they still have the same, same challenges pushing through to like our customers' customers and, and people. Um, they still have that urgent need to send money home to their families. And in some cases it's more urgent. In a lot of cases, you have people who are in wealthier countries who are not as badly impacted. And you have people in poorer countries who are more, who are more severely impacted. Or you have people who um, their, their jobs are in industries that are very badly impacted, whereas other people have jobs in industries that were not so badly impacted. So the need to send money has increased, you know, has increased. Remittances are still an essential service. Um, we've worked with some of our partners to help them waive fees. ASMO, TransferGo, Siam Commercial Bank have all worked on ways to waive fees during the pandemic or at least reduce them to make it easier for people uh, to send money home. Um, what we've also seen is we've also seen a lot of just a lot of just need, a lot of people who've lost jobs, a lot of people who just um, have had to had to take care of family members because they, you know, their kids couldn't go to school anymore. And they've had to learn how to be caregivers and how to be teachers and in some cases how to be cooks. Um, obviously, the, the struggle is different for different people. But um, one of the things that we focused on a lot is just figuring out where those needs are and seeing what we can do to help. So like Ripple donated a million dollars to Tipping Points Emergency relief fund for COVID-19. Our co-founder, Chris Larson, has been helping out food banks um, throughout Alameda County, San Francisco, and Silicon Valley. So uh, there's a lot of local issues that I think uh, I think is one of the areas where I, where I really would hope people would focus uh, very early. And of course, now we have the Pro, the you know the protests and the uh, those issues and so that's creating that new sort of like what is what is the news this new problem and you know what can we do to help uh, not to imply that it's a new problem <laughs> new attention on an old problem which I guess at least in that sense attention on a problem is a good thing. You mentioned a very interesting well and challenging um, thing. Um, I think you would agree that money still stays as a way of political control and oppression. Um, how could blockchain technology contribute to solving this issue? Or maybe any other technology or initiative? So first, I just want to say I absolutely agree. That's one of the big things that got me into blockchain. So I lived through the internet revolution, like I said before. And one of the things that I saw was control of information could be used as a tool of oppression. Like people in North Korea used to think that Kim Jong-il, their leader at the time, was like thought of as an intellectual and a snappy dresser in the West and kind of a cool person who was like respected world leader. And the internet um, sort of made it a little bit more difficult for them to make that kind of argument. And I would also say that like countries that are poor because of um, because of political issues, like North Korea would be another example. Like if you if, if all you hear is, oh, there's homeless people in the United States and their medical care is a big problem and the police are killing people, all of those things are true. Those are real problems that we have. But that does not paint a picture of what life in the United States was like compared to life in North Korea. Once people could see what life was really like in the United States, and I would say that's an information thing, that make that's, that's a tool of freedom. It's now, now the leadership of North Korea has to say, well, yes, Americans you know, have a better life than we do, but they're evil and we're good. And that's a harder argument to make. And so free flow of information is a tool of liberation. It, it's inherently a pro-freedom movement. And I would say the same thing applies to money. If you can control the way people spend money, if you know where people spend money and how people spend money and you can tax them, that's a tool that you can use for oppression. And when people can donate money to causes that they believe in without the government being able 
able to then make a list of all of the people who've gone to a particular bookstore, let's say, or who attended a particular rally because they bought tickets, like the ability to move money freely. Another thing that governments will do is uh, hyperinflation. Like we saw, I, I used to have a hundred trillion dollar note from Zimbabwe, which had, you know, incredible hyperinflation, which is also a tool. It's also a tool of impression, oppression. And if people have the freedom to hold other currencies, then you can't oppress them by inflating their currency. You can't control them that way. And so I'm hoping that um, that these blockchain technologies will provide the same kind of liberating forces that uh, the internet did with information. But I will point out that while I do think the technology is like inherently pro-freedom, I don't think it's guaranteed that like not, there's no other possibility. A lot of people, uh, younger people don't know that the internet fought many of the same battles that the cryptocurrency industry is fighting now. A good example is the United States attempting to restrict the flow of encryption technology, claiming that it was a munition. And you can't have secure community, like political dissidents can't use the internet to spread information about what the West is really like without encryption. They'll get killed. You know, they'll, they'll be put in, they'll disappear. Um, and, and the United States was fighting to control the flow of encryption for, for, for legitimate reasons. Um, if you are a country and you're used to being able to control the flow of information across your borders, losing that control is very scary. And losing the ability to control the flow of money is scary for regulators too. And so there's, there's some really, really interesting parallels that uh, I think the technology is sort of inherently liberating, but it is not guaranteed. You could imagine a world where the United States did not champion the internet and maybe China did or, or, or Russia did. And I don't think they would have built anonymity into the internet. Like, you know, every packet could have been required to have a signature from a source that was authorized by the government. You could see that type of internet having been built and that would not have been the internet that we all use, enjoy and benefit from today. So I think it's important for regulators also to keep in mind that they have a seat at the table, but if they get up, there's no guarantee that they can kind of sit back down. Um, th these technologies are going to are going to happen. Payments are terrible for new co new corporates, and um, th th their new businesses that work on the internet and sell information or broker things need to make and receive payments around the world. The existing payment networks can't do that, and so it, the world is going to change. And regulators have an opportunity to see the payment network become more open and liberating, like the way the internet did. And you can imagine another path that that could happen where that is not the case. And we need to make sure that that, that does not happen. And I think that's something everybody in this industry, uh, I think, should take seriously. The weird thing is they actually seem to. I think there's a sort of a libertarian streak throughout this in industry that largely came from the, uh, the ideologies that built Bitcoin in the first place. And I think while a lot of people don't want to talk about it too much because you do get some weird side eyes, I think there are a lot of people throughout this industry who do think that the role money could have in being a force for good and freedom is still like the reason they do it. I'm certainly not motivated by the idea of allowing a financial institution to raise their profit margin from you know seven point two to seven point three one percent or something. You know, it's about uh, it's about how you can make, you know make real change for people. Yeah, I totally agree, and I really liked your parallel. I, in my opinion, actually, money and information is basically the same. Like it's an imagined something, imagined order that we all uh, uh, decided to follow. Uh, so yeah, there is very little difference. You mentioned a very interesting thing. Um, so it's true that the, the US is a leader in developing the blockchain space, the, the internet space. Do you think that the blockchain industry is actually too US centric in, uh, in creating and building up the future that uh, is supposed to be based on the technology. Like, do you need, do you think that we need a little bit more outside views on the industry from other continents and other countries? You know, I, I don't think I've seen, I don't think I've seen that. I think it has changed a little bit over time because the regulatory environments keep changing, but I do see companies that can flee the United States for jurisdictions that are a little bit uh, more crypto friendly, but the United States is, you know, it, it, the, the, the talent pool here is incredible. I mean, there's no better place to hire engineering talent. Um, 
you know, so I think that's kind of pushing a lot of what's going on here. But if the regulatory environment in the United States, you know, doesn't get friendlier and other countries are working really hard to bring regulatory clarity, the UK is a good example, but there's, there's many others that are working to bring regulatory clarity, that they're working to build areas where you can have easy movement of, you know, of, of uh, talent and making easy to hire. Um, so I think it's going to be interesting to see the world sort of compete to, to, to kind of get talent and get the, the development going on in those, in those countries. Um, I, what's probably going to happen is as it becomes clearer that there's money to be made here, then the sort of rush to try to encourage the technology to, to domicile inside, you know, your particular region is going to, is going to increase. I think we will see and are seeing now jurisdictions sort of competing. The, the thing is, is that, that nobody wants to be a base for like a scam. And it's very hard to tell in this industry what's real innovation and what's, and what's just, you know, scam the price of admission i'll, I'll just I'll, I'll i'll just give one interesting example um there was an there were, in the early days before when bitcoin and bitcoin cash were splitting off i put some effort and obviously i know everybody in the space i follow most of the projects in the space like i'm a person who's in the best position to do their own research and come out with an informed opinion and i tried to understand in the very early days of the bitcoin bitcoin cash split what was going on and despite putting several hours into reading all the research and reading what was going on, I was left with just two completely different narratives, just one narrative from one side, one narrative from the other side, and no way to like, so it's very difficult to figure out what's, what's going on in this space. And I think no country wants to be the home base for a bunch of scams. You know, like Nigeria gets a bad rap because there's so many like scams based there and, and nobody wants to be the next, you know, the, the next Nigeria, the next home base for for what's not real innovation. And it's just so hard to tell in this space. Another thing is that it's hard to figure out how to, how to innovate. A lot of people will come to me and they say, hey, I really want to do something exciting in this space. What should I do? And it's, it's, like, it's, not, it's not like I have, oh, here's a list of 50 great things that like, you know, you should go raise money and you should go, go, go do this thing. It, it's a difficult space to operate in um, everybody seems to want, want to launch a new token. And I would, I would just warn people that nobody wants to have one form of money that they get paid in and another form of money they pay their rent in and some other form of money they buy groceries with. Like that's, that's not, that's not a, a good path. I think the other thing that happened that I think was bad for the space was during the ICO craze where people were able to raise tens of millions of dollars with nothing but a white paper, that kind of made it impossible to tell good projects from bad projects. And that kind of created a, a like everybody, like a slamming on the brakes. So everybody's like, wait a minute, like this thing is careen, this car is careening out of control down the highway with, you know, no seat belts at, you know, 90 miles an hour. And I think, I think a shakeout is good, but now the question is like, what's going to emerge from those ashes? We've had a prolonged sort of bear period where cryptocurrency prices have, um, I, I should say, I, I should say that like, you can see something as bull or bear depending on the sort of time frame that you look at. Like the cryptocurrency market cap as a whole is up something like 40% from the beginning of the year to now. So there's, it's certainly not an every, it's, it's certainly, uh, you know, it's certainly not a rising tide lifts all boats right this right now. It doesn't look like that's what's happening. So that's kind of pushing out some of the people who could otherwise innovate in this space. It's, it, it, it seems like it's almost a calm period. Yeah, great. I, I think that your ideas of inclusion are really something we, we need to think every day, especially today that it's Juneteenth. So we are celebrating freedom. Um, and freedom is freedom means different things for every person. So my question to you would be, what is freedom for you? Wow. Wow. That's a that that's a big question. That's that's a big one. Um, I would say I would say freedom to me is very much more, I see it very much more as, as sort of the absence of coercion or control than like the positive. This is kind of weird. It sounds kind of cynical, but it's not. It's sort of like the, it, it, it's like um, you're not being controlled or coerced. You're not manipulated in a certain direction. You sort of have that ability to choose the direction that you want to take in life. And you, you know, you can take, you can take that path. Um, this is, yeah, this is, this is, uh, it is Juneteenth, uh, a ripple holiday, by the way. So everybody else has off except for me. So I'm probably the only, uh, the only person, uh, I also, since you kind of brought it up indirectly, would just like to point out that um, diversity and inclusion is extremely important in this industry. It's, it can certain, you know, it can be quite difficult and, um, 
It's something that I think everybody needs to put effort into. You need to care about what your employees care about. Uh, as you know, and I will also point out one other thing. Um, one thing I've seen at a lot of at some other companies is they focus on diversity and inclusion in their hiring numbers. And what they don't look at is retention. And it's a much worse, if you're losing women or if you're losing people of color or you, you know, you're losing uh, m- minorities because they're leaving your company, that's a much worse sign than if you're not hiring them. So don't think that you know, if, if just the hiring is the, is, is the, is the end. Um, look, at, look, at your, look at your retention numbers and, and that will be your early warning sign that you have a, a worse, like a real company specific problem. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. This is really also this is a Pride Month, so this is really important to to be always aware of these things. Okay, we have last time five minutes for rapid fire questions. Are you ready? Oh boy. Okay. Basketball or chess? Oh, basketball for me. I'm a huge basketball fan. Cool. Wine or beer? Oh boy, wine. I, I will take one second just to say that people are drinking like 5% alcohol wheat juice and thinking it's a manly beverage. Come on. It's wheat juice. <laughs> Conspiration or simulation theory? Oh boy, uh, I'm going to go conspiration. Favorite music band? You know, I, I, my instinctive reaction, which is the one that you want, is the police. I was a huge fan of Sting when I was young. He hit me at a, the right time, and that those things stick with you. Oh, I adore him as well. Sea or mountains? You know, I would, I would have said mountains when I was younger, but now living in the Bay Area, I have to say sea. It is so beautiful here, so incredibly beautiful. Writing or talking? <sighs> That's a tough, that's a tough one. I enjoy both talking is so much easier, but writing you can really get so many times when you're talking, it's like, oh, that's not quite exactly what I want to say when writing, you can shape it to be, ex- I'm going to have to say writing because that ability to shape it precisely to get exactly the point and that, that feeling of, oh my God, I, sh- I had this thing that was the perfect thing I should have said when you're writing, you can go back and you can make it perfect. And I love just that, that perfection that you can't always get when speaking. Which browser do you use? I use Chrome. I've had performance issues with other ones and Chrome just seems to work for me. I'm familiar with the privacy issues. And honestly, I, I hate to admit this because privacy is so important to everything I do, but I'm one of those people who's just like, ah, whatever. I, convenience is just so much more important. I keep location tracking on on my phone and my wife's like, who are you? Why are you doing it? But it's like, it's just, it's so convenient. I feel bad about that. I should care more about my own personal privacy than I do. And I, I don't, I'm part of the problem. I apologize for that. Your favorite book? You know, I, this is going to shock people, but I'm not really a book reader. I'm just not. My wife Come reads on, books. You have so all many books behind time. you. I know. Too many of those actually came with this house. I'm embarrassed to admit. My wife is a big book reader, but it's electronic books. I mostly read. You know, I mostly uh, read things online. I have a. I tend to have a short attention span. I really enjoyed the Dune books when I was in high school. I had a long. Uh, bus ride. And so I read the Dune books during my bus ride in high school. And I really, I really enjoyed those. I like the sort of political intrigue that Frank Herbert was good at capturing. But um, I have not, I have, it's been a long time since I've read, I'm, I'm ashamed to admit it, but you know, I'm one of those, I'm, I'm honest to a fault. I should have, I should be like, you know, many other people have a list of favorite books that they can just pull one out of that they actually haven't read, but I'm not, I'm not gonna, you know, blow smoke. What about movies then? Oh, uh, movies are one of the things I miss with the lockdown. I, I I like movies a lot. I like science fiction movies a lot. But I will tell you that my favorite, and these are again movies that hit. There's a certain developmental time period where my sort of I develop my sort of intellectual self, and the things that hit me then have had tremendous staying power, both in music, in books, and and in movies. And um, The Princess Bride and Office Space are just two of my favorites. I'm a Monty Python fan, and, and but. You know, if you're tell if you were like, hey David, let's watch a movie. Like, what kind of movie would you like to see? Generally, science good science fiction movies. I just really enjoy watching. I actually watched Pacific Rim Uprising with my grandkids last night, and it's a surprisingly. I mean, obviously it has its faults, but it's a surprisingly uh, good sci-fi movie. I just like that type of action and just like the big cinematic scenes where there's like a giant spaceship or giant robots and like a a really like dark, deep large background. I just I just enjoy those kinds of. Fantastic. Favorite color? I have to say blue. I have to oh, say blue. Oh, I, I hope black. Schwartz, you know. 
<laughs> it should it should be it should be yeah okay last one what is your biggest dream today oh boy um i think i have to go with something topical and i have to say that my biggest dream is that my country the united states will come out of this funk that it's in and get some kind of unity and in particular deal with the issue of um of racism in policing and law enforcement um one of the things that i keep seeing on twitter is like you know the, the hashtag defund the police has been trending people are like well you know if we defund the police who are you going to call when there is like a problem well, there's a lot of people in this country who already don't know who to call when there's a problem because the last thing they want to do is have an interaction with the police, even where they've done nothing wrong and they have like, a, that. that's the reality for a lot of people. So I would encourage people to think, you know, what would you do if you couldn't call the police? Well, that's the reality that a lot of people in a country that should not have those kinds of problems is facing. And so solving that, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know how to finish that sentence, but that's a, that that would be a big. Well, yeah, that's a very important thought, and I think that's 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 a great way to to end this conversation, a little bit inspiring people to think and to to make this world always better, and think every day where we are moving exactly. Guys, thank you, Christina. Thank you so much. That is time. That that was excellent. That was refreshing. Um, that 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 was really really nice. We touched on a bunch of topics, but we also had some fun there. Not that we didn't have fun before, but that one was a little <laughs> bit more fun um, than than what we've been through. So listen, David, Christina, thank you so very very much for that. Um, yeah, a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Okay, guys. Well, the the oh, we have some questions. Wait a minute. Can you guys come back? Come back to me. We have some questions. Give me a moment here. I'm going to go in and grab some questions. David, if you don't mind sticking around for a couple, is that okay? Sure. All right. Let's do it. What do we got? Um, okay. Okay. Here, here's some questions. All right. Are current escrow S, uh, XRP held for central banks to utilize in the current financial crisis as per the new inclusion uh, to the CARES Act? You know, there's a lot of conspiracy theories and speculation on Twitter that people just sort of make things up out of whole cloth. Um, the word hopium is sometimes used to describe this idea that like you'll, you, you see, people will see Ripple or they'll see XRP or they'll see some other cryptocurrency and everything going on in the news. Um, there are certainly big things going on that we have not that we you know that we don't always announce, but uh, that those conspiracy theories don't have any grounding. Totally fair. Um, where do you see RippleNet in five years? Uh, I, I kind of see a, a growth of the network to the point where so many of the payments that institutions want to make can be made on RippleNet that it's their first stop. So they want to make a payment, they're going to look to RippleNet for some way to settle it. One of the things that we've been working on is regional clearing partners, which are banks that have RippleNet connections to numerous other banks in that region. So we can, uh, so you can sign up with, with RippleNet as an institution and get clearing into an entire region. We're also looking into offering other services through RippleNet, things like loans or um, maybe even as D if DeFi grows, maybe offering DeFi services to institutional uh, to institutional partners. One of the unique things that Ripple has is we have our software in the like transaction flow of all of these financial institutions and banks. So we can uh, develop some new, some new product or services or even something that comes from the DeFi space and we can offer it like immediately right into the transaction flow of those institutions. So using RippleNet as a platform to offer whatever new products and services emerge either from Ripple or from other people in the blockchain space, um, I think you're going to see more of that. Uh, you're a popular man. Um, we've had many questions for a lot of our guests, but we have more for you in Ripple than, than ever before. Um, I'll, I'll do a couple more, if you don't mind. What's happening with uh, PolySign? You know, unfortunately, I'm not really, that's one of the things where I'm under a non-disclosure agreement. I'm super excited about what we're doing at PolySign. We, we're, we're officially an institutional custody uh, company, but we're trying to do some very, very interesting things that I, I, I 
I, I just have to, I have to stop. I, I can't wait until, the, you know, pay ID was a secret until yesterday. And I was always annoyed when it was some an answer I wanted to give about pay ID and I couldn't. And now I have to do the same thing with pause. And it's like, I want to tell you things I can't. I, I got to stop there. Sorry. We'll, yeah, we'll go. There we'll, are journalists here. Yeah. And, and, and <laughs> right. we'll go off camera. You can tell me. Um, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fair. Um, and also, uh, will WhatsApp launch pay ID and XRP uh, in Brazil? Um, I can't, I can't, uh, announce any partnerships or anything like that, uh, that, that are not announced. So I can, I can read you the list of announced partners, but I'm, I can't, uh, I, I, you're never going to get an announcement like that from me because someone asked me a question. No problem. Um, one, one last question. Um, have you considered the problems of low coupling in the, the mods of the ripple network, uh, as it grows in size? I'm not exactly sure what they mean by low coupling. Um, maybe they mean uh, the XRP ledger. I'm, yeah, I'm not really sure what that. I'm not really sure what that's referring to. I, I could I could make some guesses, but I probably would get it wrong. Amazing chat and, and very good to get the, the, the community uh, really actively involved. So thank you for uh, livening that up, um, Christina. Um, and thank you very much for, for great moderating and, uh, David, uh, absolutely amazing to hear you speak. Thank you very much for being at Blockdown 2.0. My pleasure. Take care.